Many of my videos are scripted and in character. This one is not. These are all real things that I have felt, experienced, or thought related to the Sonic the Hedgehog series. I genuinely love the Sonic the Hedgehog series, not because I like doing platforming quickly, or because I am a furry, or for any other reason people typically like Sonic the Hedgehog, uh, but I genuinely think that it has good storytelling especially in Sonic Adventure 2. I often forget that other people don't consider Sonic Adventure 2 a good story. Some of my enjoyment is ironic, so like I understand why people don't consider it a good story, but like I forget that other people aren't enjoying parts of it ironically and the rest unironically. Like I just kind of forget that. Like, I, in my mind, everyone thinks it's a great story, and the ironic parts are just adding funny flavor to it, you know? I forget that other people don't see it that way. I'll talk more about why I really unironically like Sonic Adventure 2, uh, but later in the video. I want to get through some actual confessions before I just monologue about one game, okay? <laughs> that sound fair? Let's, let's continue. Let's get this out of the way here at the top. I did have a Sonic OC. His name was Swick the Flying Squirrel. He was orange and green and blue and very cool. I consider The Silver Saga one of the best comic books I've ever read, but that honestly says more about the number of comic books I've read than it does the quality of that particular comic book. I don't just play Sonic for the story. I also like the music. I love Crush 40. I love Zebrahead. Sometimes I listen to Cash Cash, sometimes I listen to the classic stuff, but mostly it's Crush 40 and Zebrahead. They're both great bands, and I love them. And then Dreams from an Absolution from Sonic 06 is great, and most of the songs from Sonic Forces, even though they're not written by any of those bands, those are also pretty good. I'm going to hate the fact that I recorded this video outside. I think that my opinion of this video is going to go way down from what I thought it was going to be. Oh my god, look at how the lighting has changed. Oh my god, I hate that. I hate that so much. That's not related to Sonic. That's just a thing that I'm confessing to you. I hate the lighting in this video that I'm making right now. Also, because I'm recording this outside and, like, the way I have this set up is crazy. I have, like, a microphone on me and the power cord is blocking the door, so I can't go get props. Originally, I was going to show you the Sonic comics I own, the Chow, the Sonic Amiibo, the Sonic Lego minifigure. I was going to show all that to you. I'm not going to go back inside because I don't want to set all this up again. But I do own all that stuff. It's not even a lot, but I am poor. Otherwise, I would probably own more Sonic merch. I would also probably have played more Sonic games. Uh, but as is, I typically read the reviews, realize, oh, no, this isn't the Sonic game that is actually good that I was hoping it was going to be, and then I don't buy it. It's been documented on this channel that when I first discovered Brian David Gilbert, I didn't like him, and part of this is due to the Sonic Bible video. I have never beheld the false Sonic. Only someone blind to the modern blasphemies of the Sonic franchise could see as clearly as I. It's an interesting study of bi biblical literalism, but I don't think it's a good dissection of Sonic canon because nothing that he talks about is actually canon in the Sonic games. It's only canon within that, and then that understanding of the Sonic canon affected things like Sad AM and the Sonic comics. But even within those, I think there were changes made. Neither Sonic is a god or could kill God, and I do not care if there is a difference! So no, in canon, Sonic is not god, nor can he kill God, and yes, Brian, there is a difference. Sonic has fought at least two gods. Uh, Chaos, he does not kill. Dark Gaia, I believe, is killed by Chip, um, who is a different character. Sonic does fight him, but Sonic is not the one that kills him, so... Speaking of which, Sonic Unleashed ends with Sonic's companion through that whole game, Chip, dying and giving Sonic the thing that he wears as a necklace, which then Sonic puts on as a bracelet. Guess what Sonic isn't wearing in any of the subsequent games? The fact that Sonic isn't wearing this bracelet in any of the subsequent games is an insult to me personally. I do not like the way that the fanbase groups the classic games and the modern games. I think it's very outdated considering that Generations was a while ago. The classic era I think is still pretty clearly well defined as everything before adventure. Um, 
Obviously, you could debate stuff like Sonic Jam and Sonic 3D Blast, like, they're 3D, shouldn't they be considered the same era as Adventure? But those aren't really main series games, they're kind of spin-offs, so you could also argue that those don't matter. What's important is that the Trilogy and Knuckles, uh, CD and Knuckles' is Chaotix, maybe, are all ca classic. Those are all the classic era, and that's what matters. The Dreamcast era, Dreamcast is in air quotes because it's not, um, it, most of it's not for the Dreamcast, but these include the adventure games, the advanced games, Sonic Heroes, Shadow the Hedgehog, the original Sonic Rush, and you can debate that the original Sonic Riders and Sonic 06 are part of this. Um, I guess Shadow is actually debatable as well. Um, all, all three of those you could argue belong in the next era, um, but they're also clearly still trying to take elements of Sonic Adventure and use those in the games. The next era is the Confused Era. This is the era during which Sega was throwing anything at the wall, calling it Sonic, and just kind of seeing what stuck. This includes most of the Riders games, debatably Sonic 06. Um, the Storybook games, Sonic Rush Adventure, Sonic Chronicles, The Dark Brotherhood. I stuttered over that, I'm keeping that in. Uh, Sonic 4. Sonic 4 and Sonic Unleashed are sort of debatable, but I, I would argue that they're part of the Confused era. I mean, Sonic Unleashed is very confused. It Most of the game you're playing as a werehog. The fact that the other parts of the game influenced how all the remaining modern games play, uh, in my mind, is almost sort of a coincidence. Like because they're clearly just kind of throwing a gimmick in there and seeing like, do the fans like this better than they like Sonic and the Secret Rings? Who knows? This is the werewolf one. And then this would begin what I would call is the actual modern era. Begins with colors, then generations, lost world, uh, mania, and forces. Sonic Boom is debatably part of the modern era, obviously. I say debatably because none of Sonic Boom is canon. Um, remember, I look at all of this through the lens of the story, and nothing that happens in Sonic Boom affects anything else. So, speaking of Sonic Boom not affecting anything else, I find it incredibly frustrating that Sonic Boom doesn't even affect other things that were part of the Sonic Boom rebrand. Like, the first two games were released simultaneously as each other because these stories were supposed to affect each other. They don't. In fact, they contradict each other. It's very stupid and very frustrating. While we're here, I tweeted that I was going to make this video, um, and someone asked me to explain what is and isn't canon. Um, this might get a little technical, I'll maybe put on screen a time to skip to, um, if I care. So this will be very detailed and nitpicky, but I guess everything I just said was also detailed and nitpicky, so you're already here. Basically, all the games that I'm going to put on screen right here are considered part of the canon, even though there are contradictions between them, um, especially with Sonic Forces, but I'll complain about that later. And some of what is different in Sonic Forces you could explain away, because there's time travel in at least these two games. Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood is considered canon, but like it takes place after everything else. This is like Sonic's last adventure after everything else happens. That is sort of the premise of this game. I've never played it, but that's my understanding. Also, these games I listed as part of the main canon, but they're all games that either involve interdimensional travel or primarily take place in games outside the main canon, but they still affect things in other games. Uh, that's especially the case with Sonic Mania. It's, it shouldn't be canon, it's part of like an alternate dimension, alternate timeline, but stuff in Sonic Mania comes up in Sonic Forces, so I would consider it part of the main canon. Also, the current run of the comics published by IDW, it, my understanding is that these are considered canon, but we'll see when the next game comes out if it respects and or acknowledges anything that's happened in the comics. We won't know till that happens how seriously they're actually taking this run of the comics. Um, but they do take place in a post-Sonic Forces universe, so everything that's happened in the games is canon in these comics. However, the original run of the comics, the Archie comics, is considered its own universe. Sonic X is considered its own universe. Like I've said, Sonic Boom is considered its own universe. Um, obviously the movie is its own universe. The Japanese OVA, the, that Sonic movie, also its own universe. Oh, Sonic Sad I Am is its own universe. It's very similar to the Archie comics, but it is its own universe. 
also the original Sonic cartoon, also its own universe. Oh, did I say Sonic Underground? Sonic Underground is its own universe too. Going back to Sonic Boom, something I do like about those games is how it kind of shortens the list of the cast. They have the main team Sonic, which is expanded to include Amy and Styx. And then they have a very short list of bad guys, who, which includes Eggman, Shadow, Metal Sonic, and then the new bad guys, each of which kind of serves a different purpose within Sonic Boom. I think it's a good balance. I wish more games struck a good balance of not quite limiting it to Sonic, Tails, and Eggman, but also not just including everyone. Another game that does this really well is Sonic and the Black Knight. I think it's got a good mix of some new characters that are King Arthur related, and then it also has just Shadow, Blaze, and Knuckles, and that's it. No other side characters. And I think that's a great cast, because that's a group of characters that have a lot of similarities, but you don't usually see just the three of them interacting. But obviously, I'm never going to play Sonic and the Black Knight. If I wanted to deal with janky Wiimote controls, I would play Skyward Sword. Rouge the Bat, especially lately, is a really... is a character whose potential has been kind of wasted. And it bugs the heck out of me. Um, Rouge the Bat is often a very misunderstood character. In my mind, she is pretty much the only lawful good character in Sonic. Like, even Tails is expressly okay with going outside the law and like destroying gun property if it means that good things happen as a result. <laughs> but Rouge only does that when she's expressly working for the gun, she's just undercover. The reason I think she's wasted is because she's also really good at being a spy. Like she's revealed to have been sent to spy on Eggman and Shadow directly from the president. That's what's implied in Sonic Adventure 2. But by Sonic Forces, all we see her do is be, you know, the guy in Shadow's ear, you know, the, the guy at the desk for Shadow, which is crazy because she's supposed to be the secret agent one. And now he's going on missions and she's, what, like his helper? That's stupid. She should be running all of Gun. That's how I would write her character progression. Because the commander of Gun is clearly corrupt and whatever. Uh, that guy should have been fired at some point and Rue should have taken his job. We never see anything like that. And it frustrates me. Or they should have gone rogue. Why is Team Dark not gone rogue yet? Why is them working for the government like the peak of their character? That's stupid. They're the dark ones. It's like they forgot that the whole point of Rouge's character is that she's a spy. It's like they just kind of forgot that. It's very annoying, very dumb. It's a waste. And of course, that's far from the worst sin about how Sonic Forces portrays characters or parts of Sonic canon. Sonic Forces just does not care about the characters it's representing. Like, they have Silver in it, but they kind of forget that Silver is not just another one of Sonic's friends. He's a guy who came back from the future to fix his original timeline, and usually at the end of every game, he goes back to his own future and says, well, it's fixed now. So he never says anything about how Eggman's doing something to change the course of history and make his future get all messed up again. He never says anything about that. He's just another one of Sonic's friends in the army. This is kind of true of all the characters. Rouge is just another one of the people in the rebellion. Knuckles and Amy kind of have their originality stripped away from them. They're just characters in the rebellion. Omega gets broken, and then in the end, he comes back and he's fixed. That's his character arc. Sega needs to stop giving us a fake out Sonic death, especially at the beginning of the game. It's fine when Sonic Adventure 2 does it. I will talk about why I like Sonic Adventure 2's story. Games after Sonic Adventure 2 shouldn't try to tell us that Sonic is dying, especially when Sonic is one of the only main characters. Like, boom, it's a little more okay because Sonic is one of like five main characters. But in Sonic Forces, Sonic's like one of three main characters, and they tell us he's killed off after one level. That's dumb. We don't believe that. It doesn't even really affect the story, because then we time skip, and Sonic is immediately back in the picture again. That said, Sonic Boom also does this pretty poorly, because it really doesn't affect the story at all. Sonic is killed, and then he's back again. 
and they tell us he's going to die right at the beginning of the game and then once once we get to the point where that's not you know a flash forward anymore we see him get shot and then he just kind of gets up and he's like ah i'm not dead guys i'm not dead i'm fine it's stupid we don't believe sonic's going to die stop stop giving us sonic fake out deaths especially when they don't affect the story at all and part of why sonic lost world has such a great story is because it does the opposite instead of sonic being the one that fakes out dies we have to watch sonic lose everybody sonic is responsible for the bad guys in sonic lost world being loose and then eggman is helping him but Eggman gets taken away from him. He loses contact with Amy and Knuckles, who were never actually there to begin with, and he loses Tails. Tails is kidnapped, Eggman's possibly dead, for all we know, and he has no one else. And everyone on Earth is going to die, and the bad guys doing it are only able to do it because of something Sonic did. And it is one of the darkest and most, like, introspective moments in a Sonic game, because rather than saying, Sonic's dead, what are we going to do without Sonic? It's saying, Sonic, the character who's motivated by his friendships, is alone. Can he do this by himself? And that's such a more interesting question to ask. At the very least, there's never been a Sonic fake-out death where, like, then the other characters all had to gather the Chaos Emeralds, put them in a ring around him, and then, like, had a human girl make out with him in order to wish him back to life. I think that would be the most crunchy thing that I can imagine. And I'm, at the very least, uh, Sega has never actually done that. So, um, we, we can be thankful for that, at least. I have described the Sonic movie as being too bad to really enjoy, but too good to really hate. It's, it's too in the middle. Um, but the more I've thought about it, the more I think it is both bad enough to hate and good enough to enjoy. It's somehow both. Let's start with a dumb thing. I hate Tom. I hate him so much. He just bores me and his character arc about like having to accept life in a small town and maybe this is better for him. It's kind of a weird arc, period. But why is it in a Sonic movie? That said, I really love Jim Carrey's Dr. Robotnik. I think that he actually did great, which is crazy to me, because there's only a, one other movie I've seen where I like Jim Carrey, but I really like his portrayal of the character because it shows us the transition from the classic machines are superior to living things Dr. Robotnik to the more modern Sonic is the bane of my existence Dr. Eggman, which it's really fun to see that transition. Um, it's a very good, very um, well thought out interpretation of the character and I really like it. I like Sonic for a similar reason, like he doesn't totally feel like Sonic at the beginning and I think the whole, his interactions with Tom don't really feel like Sonic either, but I feel like as the movie goes on he gets closer and closer to being Sonic as I understand and like the character. Plus there's so many little details sprinkled in that like make me think a sequel could be really great. The problem with if they're going to make sequels is that Sonic is already stupidly overpowered. Sonic, outside of the comics, which Sonic's basically a different character in the comics, so just ignore them. Outside of the comics, Sonic should not be fast enough to basically move through stopped time. But he is in this, which is crazy because if... I mean, in the second movie, they're probably going to focus on in introducing Tails and Knuckles, maybe Amy, maybe Metal Sonic. They're probably not going to do Shadow the Hedgehog until movie 3, which hopefully they do movie 3 and introduce Shadow the Hedgehog. We'll talk about that later. But when they do, how do you do the moment when, like, the camera goes into slow-mo and Shadow is actually moving faster than Sonic, and then Sonic realizes that's not his speed, he's using some kind of supernatural ability. Hey, it's not his speed. He must be using the Chaos Emerald to... How do we do that if Sonic himself already has this similar supernatural ability just innately without a Chaos Emerald? That's a little weird. And I like the decision in theory to not need Chaos Emeralds and just make Sonic the MacGuffin himself. That's fun and cool, and I like 
moving away from the Chaos Emeralds. I love the lore of Chaos and the Master Emerald and everything, but I do really like not having them at all. It's very fun and forces them to not just retell the same story over and over. But Sonic is too powerful. I mean, he can literally use, like, Electrokinesis, and this is a guy who fights robots. That's too powerful. How, how do you tell interesting stories with that? Unless you're making him into Sonic as he's portrayed in the comics, rather than Sonic as he's portrayed in the games, you're making him too powerful. And honestly, even though I enjoy the comics, I think Sonic in the games is actually the more compelling character. So I was originally at this point in the video going to pitch you my ideal version of the second Sonic movie and the third Sonic movie, but that can pretty much be summed up in introduce Tails, Knuckles, May Amy, and Metal Sonic in Sonic 2. Make the story kind of about that. Don't really focus too much on Tom. Maybe pair him with Amy and have both of them try to get back to Sonic, like trap them in Mushroom World or something. And then Sonic 3 uh, introduce Shadow the Hedgehog and basically do the story of Sonic Adventure 2. That pretty much sums it up. But I never actually talked about why I like the story of Sonic Adventure 2 so much. Um, so let's talk about that. Sonic Adventure 2 is maybe the story that tells us who Sonic is as a character better than any other story about Sonic outside of the comics, which again, I consider these two very different characters. And they do this in a way a lot of good fiction does, by giving Sonic a foil, and that foil's name is Shadow the Hedgehog. A foil is a uh, thing in fiction that basically shows you everything a character is not. So Shadow is not all evil, and Sonic isn't totally all good but he's also not really a flawed character. Sonic's not a character that needs to change, but Shadow is a character that changes wildly from the beginning of the game to the end. Sonic is static, Shadow is dynamic. Shadow is proud, Sonic is humble. Sonic has friends, Shadow has allies that he manipulates and uses for a secret goal he tells no one. Sonic trusts people, Shadow does not. And yet, Sonic is free, independent, beholden, to no one or no thing, and Shadow is beholden to everyone. He's entirely motivated by a promise he made to Maria. He is secretly being manipulated by Gerald Robotnik. He owes Eggman a favor. And the story of these two characters and how they're contrasted between the, each other, uh, really the whole game is about it, but it can also be boiled down to a few key scenes. Depending on which story you're playing, you discovered a few cutscenes ago why these two are fighting. Sonic is trying to fight for his freedom because the government thinks he's Shadow. Shadow is actively antagonizing the government because he lost Maria to them. Then the two meet. Sonic realizes that Shadow is the cause of his problems, and Shadow realizes, hey, this idiot thinks he's better than me. Then the two meet and fight each other several other times later through the game. Huh. You're not even good enough I'll to make be you eat those words. But then the second most important moment in the story is when Shadow thinks Sonic dies. I guess he was just a regular hedgehog after all. And yet Sonic does. Sonic uses Shadow's supernatural ability to survive. I wasn't sure if I could pull that one off. Somehow I managed to use the chaos control. The chaos control? And when Shadow discovers this, he asks him you know, I thought you were just a regular hedgehog, what the f are you? And Sonic's response is, I'm just a guy who loves adventure, I'm Sonic. And it's a great moment and it's why I think the whole point of this story is showing us who Sonic is by contrasting us to Shadow. Because through the whole story, Shadow is loudly declaring himself the ultimate pinnacle of what life is. And that's all building to the moment when Shadow asks Sonic, what are you? Because Shadow is incredibly proud, and yet Sonic makes him realize he's not the greatest thing in the universe. But Sonic doesn't even seem to be fully aware that he's more than just a guy. Whoever wins or loses that fight doesn't matter, because then the third most important point in the story is Shadow then changing who he is as a result of all these events, as a result of Amy reminding him that Maria didn't actually want him to inflict revenge on the people of the planet. Maria was kind, that's why Shadow loved her, and Maria wanted Shadow to make the people of Earth happier. And so Shadow joins Sonic 
in stopping the plan that Shadow put into motion to destroy the planet. And Shadow gives his life to make people happier like Maria wanted to. And Sonic ends the story still free, but saddened by the loss of a friend he never really got to have until other games bring Shadow back, because Shadow is cool. But he's never really as cool in other games as he is in this one, because other games think he's just cool because he's black and red and edgy. And I don't really have any other confessions I haven't already said, so uh, that's gonna be the end of this recording session. Um, uh, till next time, sayonara, Shadow the Hedgehog. I'm the